One of the greatest pieces of literature in the world is the book of Isaiah in our Old Testament scriptures. It is absolutely a masterpiece of poetry, prophecy, history, and theology. Now, Isaiah's ministry took place about 700 years before the birth of Christ, and yet it's filled with messianic prophecy. It is Isaiah who spoke of the virgin birth of Jesus in chapter 7, verse 14, and Matthew quotes that in relation to the birth of Jesus. It is Isaiah who spoke the beautiful words that we hear read every Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It was Isaiah who penned those words. So with such a a marvelous book at our disposal, you shouldn't be surprised that today's great text is from that book. We're going to look at a passage taken from the prophet Isaiah. And the passage we're going to look at, and you need to understand this, it, it, it falls within a section that describes the servant of the Lord. And that's Isaiah 49 through 55. The servant of the Lord. And on one level, the servant of the Lord is none other than the nation of Israel. Because God says in chapter 49, verse 3, You're my servant, Israel in whom I will display my splendor. But on another level, this applies to a person who arises out of that nation. The nation of Israel failed to carry out the will of God. So it was that person who brought God's will to its full and final realization. And that person, of course, is Jesus the Messiah. Our text for today is going to tell us about his travail, his suffering, and his victory, his triumph, all through which he accomplished the divine purpose. So we begin reading in Isaiah 52, verse 13, and we'll read through the end of chapter 53 from the New International Version. What a great passage, folks. If I don't do anything else but read this to you today, you should be blessed by it. See, my servant will act wisely He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain. And bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we're healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. 
Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, folks, any approach to this passage, I think, has to be characterized by reticence and by reluctance. I really don't feel worthy to preach from this passage, but God is, has given me that opportunity. But th this is just holy ground. There's nothing in all of Scripture more arresting than this picture of the servant of the Lord. And, and I think as you read it, you're, you're aware of this appalling gloom. There's this picture of suffering, and yet it shines with this brilliant glory. And you, you have both of those things in this, in this passage. So I just want us to come near with the realization that, that we're dealing with matters that are ultimately too deep for final interpretation. We are indeed on holy ground here. Now, some 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Isaiah wrote these words. He spoke very clearly about the Messiah and especially about the death and the triumph of the Messiah. And this passage is so graphic. It is so pointed. It is so clear that I understand that there are Jewish lectionaries that have omitted it from public reading because it is confusing to those who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah that was talked about here. As I read the text, I, I'm sure that you, if you were listening, if you were following along, you saw Jesus in every line because that's, that's who it's talking about. Now, the introduction to the text is chapter 52. That's why I went back there. Chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. It begins with the words in the NIV, my servant will act wisely. The Revised Standard Version, the New English Bible, the today's uh, New Living Translation, and the complete Jewish Bible all use the word prosper instead of the word wisely, or they use the word success instead of the word wisely. And that may be the better translation. The Lord you know, my servant will prosper. My servant will succeed. And his prosperity comes as he is raised and, and lifted up and highly exalted. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. As Paul told the Philippians, therefore, because of what he did, therefore God has highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, to the highest place and gave him a name that's above every name, Philippians 2, verse 9. But before that exaltation, there had to be a time of suffering and agony and sorrow. And I want you to look at the beginning of verse 14, if you have your Bibles open. Just as there were many who were appalled at him... Most of your Bibles will have a footnote indicating that the word him could be translated you. Just as there were many who were appalled at you speaking to the nation of Israel, so this is how they looked at Jesus. I, I think that's, that's a good translation as well. In the eyes of the world, the nation of Israel was nothing a tiny little group of people trying to hang on to their sovereignty for dear life. They couldn't possibly be God's chosen people. Not that bunch. And so just as many were appalled at you and astonished that that claim would ever be made, so it was with the Messiah. He was considered nothing by this world, folks. He was disfigured, as Isaiah talks about, marred beyond recognition. People in the world are astonished. They're appalled at that idea. That, that man, that man hanging on the cross, no way he can be the Messiah. No way he can be the Son of God. Because to the world, suffering is not the way to victory. But it is God's way. And because of this disfigurement because of the suffering that he goes through. Isaiah says he will sprinkle many nations. Now, you know that all through the Old Testament, the word sprinkle refers to purification. It refers to cleansing, to washing. 
It's the word used to refer to the sacrificial blood that's sprinkled on the altar. And he's saying that here, this servant of the Lord, he's going to cleanse the nations with his blood. And kings, those in high places, they will hear and they will see and they will understand what God is doing through him. And that's the way he introduces this. And then you come to chapter 53. And in verses 1 through 9 of, of that text, uh, Isaiah paints a vivid picture of the travail or the suffering of the Lord's servant. First of all, we see him being rejected. Verses 1 through 3. Who will believe our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you know that statement is quoted in John chapter 12, verse 38? I, I just want to go off track here for just a moment. Do you know that this passage that I've just read to you is quoted or alluded to 15 times in the New Testament? 15 times. But this particular part about who, who will believe our message, uh, that's quoted in John 12, 38 in the context of the unbelief and the rejection of Jesus by the Jews. It sets up the whole idea of the rejected Messiah. Now, this servant of God grew up before him, grew up before God like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. In other words, he was like a fresh branch that grows out of this old stump, like a sprout coming out of dry ground. That's an affirmation that God is pleased and satisfied with his servant, but that isn't how the world looks at him. No, the world looks like this or says this. He had no beauty. Or no majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Now that doesn't mean that the servant of the Lord lacked beauty or comeliness. Doesn't mean he's ugly. It means that the world was blind to his beauty. And this continues to this day. The world is blind to the true nature of Christ. And because of that blindness... He is despised and rejected by mankind. He is held in low esteem. Now here's an important truth, especially as we try to share the good news of, of Jesus with people in the world. It is because of his suffering that many people reject him. You know that? Many, many people in this world just cannot accept the idea of a suffering Savior. And there are even people in the church who reject the bloody gospel. That's what makes him unacceptable. That is why they despise and reject him. Because of his suffering. Because of what he did. But that's what God does. And that's how God works. Now in verses 4 through 6, this rejected servant of God is portrayed then as the vicarious sufferer. In other words, what he did, he did for others. He did for us. I want you to notice the wording again, all right? Listen. He took up our pain. He bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He bore the sins of many. The substitutionary suffering of the Messiah is a theme that's found throughout the New Testament scriptures. In our sinfulness and in our failure, he died for us. He is the vicarious sufferer. And that's what's presented there in verses 4 through 6. And then you come to 7 through 9 and you see the servant portrayed as a lamb. And that's why we picked out these songs, so, much, so many songs about the lamb of God and taking the sin of the world and all of that. When you read this section, you cannot help but see the crucifixion story in every line. Let me just remind you of some of the things that Isaiah said. Jesus was silent before his accusers. Yes, he did some talking. He talked a little bit to Pilate, didn't talk to Herod, didn't talk to the Jewish leaders. He was really silent. He didn't try to argue and, and answer, you know, all the questions, just was silent. He was forcibly arrested, sentenced. No one spoke up for him. A lot of people tried to accuse him, 
but no one spoke up for him. He died between two thieves. He's buried in a rich man's tomb. And all of that happened even though he was totally innocent. And Isaiah talks about all of that. 700 years before it ever happens, he revealed that to us. And all of that speaks to me of the willingness of the Messiah to lay down his life for the transgressions of my people. And then the last part of the text tells of the triumph or the victory of the servant of the Lord. This is verses 10 through 12. Did anything about that part of the reading capture your attention? Did these words make you set up a little bit? Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was the Lord's will that he suffered. Yes, the travail and the suffering is set in the midst of human misunderstanding and human evil, but it was all according to God's divine will. I recall the words of Peter in his sermon on Pentecost when he said, This man, this Jesus, was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Folks, the cross of Jesus wasn't an accident that God was somehow able to take and use for his eternal purposes. It was his intent all along. Through travail came triumph. 700 years before it happened, Isaiah tells us about it. And again, I want you to notice the, the language that Isaiah uses in these verses to speak of the servant's victory. He will see his offspring and prolong his days. And somebody says, well, Jesus didn't have any offspring. Oh, yes, he did. We're his offspring. We're his children. And he sees that. And, and, and his days have been prolonged. Yes, he died on the cross, but the grave could not hold him. And he is raised from the dead. Isaiah goes on to say, the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled the will of God. And he goes on to say, and he will see life and be satisfied. It may well be that it is God himself who sees and is satisfied by what the Messiah accomplished through his suffering. And then he will be given a portion with the great, even though he was considered as nothing, esteemed not by humans, who in all the world right now has a greater name than Jesus the Messiah. He's given that portion with the great. And he will divide the spoils with the strong. By his death and resurrection, Jesus has plundered the house of the enemy. The spoils are his. What a great passage. It, it, just, it, just, it just marvelous. And, and like I said, I, I hardly can do any kind of justice to it. I want to conclude, though, the lesson with a quote from a paper that was written on Isaiah 53, written by Rodney Thomas. And, and Rodney is the associate minister at the Broadway Church here in Lubbock. And I want you to read what he said about the text. I'm going to read to you what he said about the text. Listen. It challenges us, the text, the words of Isaiah, what he said about the suffering servant, all right? It challenges us to see a God who is not vengeful, arrogant, self-righteous, or even stoic. The picture of God that we get from Isaiah 53 is one of a God who is passionate, humble, forgiving, and willing to sacrifice his own sense of dignity for a relationship with those who do not deserve it or even understand it. That deep truth challenges me to understand that God loves me far more than I can ever begin to imagine. And he has reached out and continues to do so despite my blindness, my ignorance, my na naivety. In the crucified Messiah, I feel that I begin to capture a glimpse of the heart of God. And it's truly awe-inspiring and at the same time frightening. It challenges me to empty myself of my selfish ambitions, my fears, my life, and to place myself fully in his hands, full well knowing that it will mean that I will suffer and bleed and die when I do this. This is the call of God who stretched out his arm to bleed and die for us through Jesus Christ. And that's the end of the quote. 
but it calls us, doesn't it, to a God who is maybe far different than what a lot of us have ever imagined, a God of such astounding love and compassion and grace and forgiveness. I want to ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you know this Jesus? I mean, really know him. He died for you. He took upon himself all of your sins and your transgressions. Have you surrendered your life to him? That's what we invite you to do today. In light of this passage, in light of who Jesus is and what he's done, we invite you to come to confess his name, to acknowledge that he's your Lord, to be buried with him in baptism if you've never done that. We invite you to do that. The invitation of Paul continues to ring in our ears to this very day when he said, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, please. He wants you to be reconciled to him. He's done all of this for you from the very beginning. You know, one of the songs we sang, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. It's not an afterthought. It's been God's plan all along. He invites you to accept it through Jesus Christ. Let's stand together while we sing this next song.